So hello and welcome to video number one in which we're going to be looking at a um, kind of uh, just a basic definition of paleobiogeography so we can all start on the same page and then some of the history of this topic. Now I haven't had the time in this lecture course to mention the history of all of the topics that we've been through even though they're really interesting and I think they're a really good way of actually understanding the origin of some of the ideas that you've been taught so if you ever want to learn about it I would encourage you to do so. But I thought it would be particularly useful to cover the history of this topic partly because um, it helps us understand where it's come from and kind of the insights that paleobiogeography or at least biogeography have had on the development of our understanding of evolution and that's quite important but also I wanted to talk about history in at least one of these lectures so I could introduce a few really important kind of concepts when it comes to considering um, history and the history of science and what is good practice and what is bad practice because I think that's also really important. Obviously you're not sitting a history of science degree where you would learn more about this but um, I think the opportunity to quickly go over some of the important things about studying the history of science is really really valuable so I hope you won't mind if I spend um, just one slide really introducing a, a couple of concepts regarding how we should think about the history of topics like paleobiogeography. So without further ado, let's define our term. So I'm going to be saying this a lot. Um, paleobiogeography is a fairly long and horrible word, but all paleobiogeography, that's a good start, isn't it? If I can't pronounce it at this stage, all paleobiogeography is, is the scientific study of the geographic distribution of fossils, as you can see um, from this definition on the slide. More broadly, we may want to expand out this definition a tiny bit, we can say that paleobiogeography encompasses the study of the coevolution of the Earth and its biota by considering how tectonic and climatic changes have affected the evolution and the distribution of organisms. So that's quite a lot in there, but basically we're talking within that definition of a very broad topic looking at the historical interactions on a very grand scale in deep time between living um, systems and the Earth. It reflects the fact that the Earth system is important to the biological system because it controls through a variety of processes many aspects of organismal uh, distribution and evolution. So by organismal I mean just relating to organisms. So the earth controls the distribution and the evolution of life on earth. Makes sense. It's useful to highlight that a major research area within paleobiogeography uh, relates to evolutionary patterns in clays of organisms and how those interface with tectonic and climatic changes. So it's this kind of broad um, intermingling of um, evolution and of the uh, changes that we've seen in the earth in deep time. So it's important because the geographic distribution of fossils has played a really important role in helping us understand many elements of life such as regional differences in diversification, so differences in diversification in different regions of the earth, and in extinctions and the um, the spatial um, kind of patterns that we see in extinctions and the track of migrations. But it also works the other way around. Fossil organisms um, have actually really helped us understand the history of the Earth itself. For example, paleobiogeography contributed crucial evidence to the development of theories of continental drift and plate tectonics. Without evidence from fossils, we would really struggle to have um, to have come to these realizations, or at least we would have had to use. Um, different bits of evidence. So there's lots of evidence that for these things that do, do exist, but fossils were played a key role in that re the realization of how this system works. So you can see in this image just uh, one example of paleobiogeography that I chose. Um, I'm not going to say at random, I chose it because I think these are really cool fossils. So these are some fossils which are um, early relatives of the echinoderms. They're really cool creatures. Um, so at uh, at uh, some point in the evolution of the echinoderms, which today generally, but not always, have pentameral symmetry, five-way symmetry, um, the ancestors of this group went from being bilaterally symmetrical through a region or a period of time of having very little symmetry towards being pentaradial. And these fossils that you see on the left are representatives of that stage in the change of, of that symmetry. And on the right, you can see a series of um, 
reconstructions of the globe during the Ordovician period when these creatures were alive, showing their distribution. And it's this kind of exercise that has helped us to understand many elements of evolution of different groups, as well as actually helping us piece together this picture of the globe during this and other time periods. So I think that's a, a good example of paleobiogeography, just looking at the distribution of these little dudes through space at some period of time. Now, right there is paleobiogeography. So where has paleobiogeography come from? Well, it's got a surprisingly deep history. Um, and I'm going to spend the next few slides looking at how the field has developed since it was born. It has a, this is an area which has a long intellectual heritage extending back well before a, a seminal event, which was Darwin's um, 1859 publication of On the Origin of Species. Early players in this history include Carl Linnaeus, this um, handsome chap on the left-hand side here, who lived from 1707 to 1778. He was a natural philosopher. He was, that's what people called scientists before science was a word. He was born in southern Sweden and educated in Uppsala University, still going today and still a fantastic place um, to visit if you ever get the opportunity. Really love Uppsala University and Uppsala the town. His true love was plants. Um, so much so, they even appear on his coat of arms, which is shown on the right-hand side here. He's a gentleman that actually studied medicine, but at this time, uh, medics needed to know about plants in order to create medicines. That's where medicines came from. And he's actually primarily remembered today for the fact that shortly after he moved to the Netherlands to continue his um, studies in medicine, he published a book called Systema Naturae, which classified all living and indeed mineral things. You can see the front page from an edition of this in the middle here. So he did well there. He did uh, arguably slightly less well when he proposed that modern biogeographical distributions, so that's di the distribution of living animals in space, resulted from the dispersal, dispersion, sorry, dispersion, dispersal is the word I'm looking for there, of species from an island paradise located in the tropics. So that was his idea to explain <clears throat> the spatial distribution of living organisms. In this explanation, land areas had mystically emerged with the retreat of the seas, and all species originated and dispersed from this centre of origin, driven and enabled by favourable ecological conditions. So um, that is one of his uh, ideas that didn't quite stick, unlike the Linnaean taxonomy, which we've already learnt about in this course, which did stick. Um, and I think that's, that's really useful to demonstrate that both Sometimes we take blind alleys in science, no matter who we are, but also um, that actually people started thinking about this relatively early on in the history of kind of biological and evolutionary thought. Early observations of relevance, um, which kind of helped build the field of paleobiogeography as it currently stands today, is uh, include um, ideas from Georges-Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon, he is a French, sorry, is, he was a French naturalist. Um, he was amongst the first people to realize the powerful effect that the Earth system has on its biota. So he argued that the Earth makes the plants and the Earth and the plants make the animals. So he noticed um, important patterns in paleobiogeography and he established one of the first principles of biogeography. This is that birds and mammals occupying the same environments, but in geographically isolated regions, will often be very different, so they're not made of the same species. Buffon cl classified the globe into the new and the old world, each with its distinctive groups of plants and animals. So that was a really important observation, which was further refined by this gentleman in the middle. This is um, Augustin de Candol. Um, who is a Swiss botanist. I apologize if I've horribly mispronounced that name. Um, he recognized a difference between factors that control organismal distribution on small and large scales. He noticed, for example, that on a small scale, temperature, light, and ecology um, will control the distribution of organisms, whereas on a large scale, this was more related to geography and geology, so the continental configuration. So that is another important development in the mode of thought towards understanding the distribution of organisms that are alive today. The dude on the far hand, right hand side is Charles Lyell. Um, he 
is a um, really important Scottish geologist who built on this work, recognizing that the geographic ranges of species and clades were dynamic and that they change with geological or climatic changes. That's a really important observation. He argued that in order to understand the geographic distribution of organisms, it was necessary to learn the geological and climatic history of the regions they occupied. So again, this is all helping us bring, bring the field to work towards where we are today. And those are all important observations that have stood the test of time. I mentioned another player here, Alexander von Humboldt. He's a very famous German scientist who was a pioneer of documenting the distribution of plants, especially in slightly risky trips to South America that he undertook. So by the middle of the 1800s, both Charles Darwin, shown on the left-hand side here, and Alfred Russell Wallace, shown here, had started working on um, the fauna and the flora of regions that have their own um, kind of um, a collection of species. Um, in Charles Darwin's case, this was, was the Galapagos Islands, and in Russell, well, oh, sorry, Alfred Russell Wallace's case, this was the East Indies. <coughs> Darwin was a big fan of Lyle. So for example, he took the um, book that Lyle wrote on geology called Principles of Geology with him on the famous voyage of the Beagle where he visited the Galapagos and came up with some of his islands that ultimately led him to come up with the theory of evolution as represented by this wonderful sketch that he made in one of his notebooks that was last week reported stolen from the University of Cambridge, FYI. So if you see a Darwin notebook lying around, um, a University of Cambridge would like to know. He offered, so this is Darwin again, offered a series of examples building on Lyle's approach to the study of the distribution of organisms when he wrote up his um, famous voyage, the Beagle. So he actually started building on Lyle's work to understand the geographic distribution of species. Alfred Russell Wallace is famous as the second person that came up with uh, the idea of evolution after Charles Darwin had sat on it for quite a long time, not wanting to publish. Um, many for, for a variety of reasons. I think it's actually really interesting to, to read about if you have the time to do so. Um, but Darwin was forced into publishing that when Russell Wallace independently came up with the same idea based on a fevered dream he'd had while suffering with malaria. But in addition to his work on evolution, Wallace was the first to recognize a correlation between geographical distribution and evolutionary relationships. Um, this is something we will explore further in the remaining videos as we learn more about biogeography and paleobiogeography. He was also one of the first people to argue that scientists can use the evolutionary histories of faunas to elucidate geological history. So he was the first to point out that these can be helpful in helping us understand geology as well as evolution. So well done, Alfred Russell Wallace. The collections of species in different areas have changed through time. Um, as have continental configurations and positions. We know this now, right? We know that continents shift in their position through time. And paleontological data were instrumental in demonstrating the drift of these wandering continents. For example, we could have guessed this based on the fit of the outlines of Africa, South America, India, Antarctica, and Australia. Um, this was clearly not a coincidence. But this um, idea or oh, this tessellation was then built upon by the recognition that the um, matching the uh, on across these these continents there were matching rocks and in those rocks were particular fossils um, that helped join up zones within these ancient or within these continents that spoke of a, a, an ancient and different configuration. In the early 1900s, a German polar researcher named Alfred Wegener, shown on the left here, who was around from 1880 to 1930, argued that the continents moved across the Earth's surface on a liquid core. It was a revolutionary idea, um, and it didn't really stick, to be fair, because um, Wegener was not able to identify a mechanism capable of driving this continental drift. Indeed, it took 50 years before seafloor spreading was documented and plate the plate tectonic revolution of the mid-1960s confirmed his theory. But at that point, and since then, paleobiogeographic data, so the, the distribution of fossils, has continued to provide refinements in reconstructing ancient geographies and new tools have come along that have helped us understand and use these distributions even better. 
So well done, Alfred Wegener. Um, this is an example of the distribution of fossils across ancient continents that we'll actually return to in the next video. So I'm not going to talk about it much here. I wanted to finish this video by very quickly hi highlighting um, that, if you will forgive me the brief aside, when we talk about the history of thought in areas such as this one, um, often in the kind of lectures that I give where we're talking about the um, ideas themselves, not how those ideas developed, and the history is, I guess, by necessity, unfortunately, more of an aside, um, we present history in a very particular way. And I wanted to mention that this was one of the shortcomings of the approach that I've just used. By definition, when I am talking about the history, like the one we've just gone over, in the vast majority of cases, other than that Linnaeus blind alley that he went down, I've been talking about how our current state of knowledge came to be. This means that I am guilty of contributing to something that the historians of science call Whiggism. This is a idea that's named after the Whigs. This is the UK's second political party um, back in the um, 18th and 19th century. Um, who were advocates of the power of parliament and the abolition of the slave trade, so they did some good things. But they also had this habit of um, rewriting history. So Whig historians evolved a way of writing English history that situated them in the position of the good guys, no matter what it was that they had done. So that idea uh, of, of, of rewriting history is prevalent in um, many of the presentations of history that we look at. Um, and Whiggism is something that we should consider. This is the idea that the kind of only important developments in an area of science are those which led us to where we are now. And it's one that looks at the history of science only from the viewpoint of what we know now. Technically, we would call this a teleological or goal-directed and hero-based trans-historical narrative, for what that's worth. But what it basically means is that we miss all of the ideas out that didn't quite work. All of the efforts that people put into understanding the world, we don't tend to learn about, at least in stories like the one that I just told you. And it's it kind of means that we start interpreting history as a story of progress towards the present. If you want to learn more about that, please see the um, reading here for further discussion about what Whiggism is. I think it's really worth doing. Um, but I just wanted to mention this because for the record, right now, I have just been really Whiggish. All I've told you about, really, is the ideas that were correct. And we've missed a whole load of really interesting ideas that weren't inherently wrong. And they definitely weren't stupid. They just turned out not to be correct. They turned out to be extrapolations based on the of ev extrapolations of evidence that no longer um, we, do we hold to be true. So an example of that, an example of what I have kind of glossed over, is that um, the early realizations um, that Darwin made were mediated as he got older, and he came to focus far more on the role of competition between species and other biological mechanisms um, in terms of how those promote divergence, and de-emphasized in many of his later works geological change as an agent of evolution. So when I was talking about Darwin as having recognized the Galapagos Islands as this um, special place with this special collection of species, actually later in his career, he kind of moved away from that idea as he moved towards the idea of all change being driven by evolution. So that's just one small example of how I've been Whiggish in this particular section. So I apologize for that, but I hope introducing you to the concept has been interesting to you. So with that, I'm going to end this video and I will see you in the next one very shortly. See ya.